all of the assisting clergy, retired clergy, deacons, seminarians, and lay preachers who are preaching today this Sunday after Easter Day. Seems to happen three times a year. This Sunday, the Sunday after Easter Day, the Sunday after Christmas Day, and those two are because the regular uh, clergy, the rectors, the deans, the pastors have had enough of preaching and they need a week off. Uh, and so somebody else gets to be the preacher. And then the third time that it happens most years is on Trinity Sunday because, well, it's Trinity Sunday and every preacher is probably going to get it wrong somehow. So you get someone else to preach on Trinity Sunday. But I'm very glad to be able to be a part of that multitude and to be able to give a break to Melinda on this Sunday. Now, a couple of months ago, I saw a cartoon in a magazine. Now, this is not a laugh cartoon. This just was drawn as a cartoon, and it showed two stick people sitting at a table. One of them said, I believe, but sometimes I don't. And the other one said, I don't believe, but sometimes I do. And I want to suggest that that representation, that conversation at the table, those two people encountering each other are what we experience around us and among us. And I think sometimes if we're honest within us, all the time. Many people look upon this time that we live in and call it a secular age, and I agree. The secular age means that we are educated and formed and our public social interactions all take place without any reference at all to God, except as a private opinion and an optional belief. Now, there's some reasons that we have evolved into a secular age, and some of them are Christians' own fault, killing each other over the years in wars. And not everything about a secular age is bad at all, but it also has some limits and some drawbacks. People who are formed in a secular age, many of them find themselves saying, I, I don't believe, but sometimes I do. Or maybe I don't believe, but sometimes I wish I could. Last week in Holy Week, there was an article in the Guardian newspaper from England, and it was written by a young person named John Harris, and the title of the article was, How Do Faithless People Like Me Make Sense of This Past Year of COVID? And here's a couple of quotes from his piece. Like millions of other faithless people, I have not even the flimsiest of narratives to project onto what has happened, nor any real vocabulary with which to talk about the profundities of life and death. Beyond a handful of close friends and colleagues in my immediate family, there has been no community of like minds with whom I have talked about how I am feeling or ritualistically marked the passing of all these grinding weeks and months. For many of us, Life without God has turned out to be life without fellowship or shared meaning. Now, I don't quote that to, to in any way act superior or condescending. Actually, I, I read it with a lot of compassion. This represents an awful lot of people around us and maybe even part of a conversation within us. So let's bring it alongside today's gospel, the gospel about Thomas, which we always hear on this Sunday every year. Thomas, of course, didn't live in a secular age, but the gospel and his story brings up issues about belief and faith and trust. The disciples had been encountered by the risen Jesus a week before, but Thomas wasn't there. So after this had happened, they, they went to Thomas and said, we have seen the Lord. And he said, unless I see, I will not believe. 
well, when he does get to see, when the risen Christ comes to them again and Thomas is there and, he, and Thomas believes, then Jesus says to him, do not doubt, but believe. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And then at the end of the passage, the, the writer says that these are written so that you may come to believe. That's us, those who have not seen. These are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Now, the New Testament, of course, is written in Greek, and there's a Greek word that underlies this constant reference to belief. And I'm not sure we're served well by having it translated as belief, because in our context now, believing seems to become mostly about acknowledging intellectually that we consent that certain things are true. That's what belief has come to mostly mean to us. Now, I'm not against belief. We need to have beliefs, and we need to work them out. And I, I'm at a point in my life where I find myself saying, you know, I'd rather believe too much and be wrong about a few things than believe too little and miss the main point. So belief is important. But the Greek word, maybe a closer rendering would be the word faith. That's better. Faith is a, is a bit more complex. It's bigger. It's, it's more basic than belief, less intellectual maybe. But I think most of us still, even the word faith has been assimilated toward acknowledging whether or not certain things are true. Because if we say about somebody, she has a lot of faith, we usually mean she really believes things really strongly. So maybe we need to get even closer to what that Greek word is which is the word trust, trust, even deeper and more basic than belief and faith. Let's listen to the gospel again and replace the word belief with trust. Thomas says, unless I see, I will not trust. Jesus says to him, do not mistrust, but trust. Have you trusted because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to trust. These are written so that you may come to trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through trusting, you may have life in his name. Centuries ago, back in the classic period of the English Reformation, our great Theologian Richard Hooker wrote a sermon about faith and doubt, and among the many insightful things he said in that sermon, he said that if we're doubting a whole lot of things, if we actually care about that, if it matters to us that we're struggling with our beliefs, if we care, then that means that we love, and the love comes as a gift of God who is love. So beneath any struggles we may be having about believing or not believing certain things, if we care about that, we love. And love is a connection with God. I also saw on Twitter during Holy Week, uh, a young woman posted, she, she said, you know, believing in God is over for me. It will never come back. I'm not able to believe in God anymore but I still want to participate in the life of the church. Would the Episcopal Church welcome me? And when our retired bishops responded and said, not only would we welcome you, but it sounds like you really need the Eucharist. So what I want to say is, is let's just open the doors and welcome everyone to the table, those around us, those among us, and maybe even that conversation that sometimes goes on within us, wherever it is on this whole business of, I believe, but sometimes I don't, I don't believe, but sometimes I do. Because if we care, we love, 
And if we love, it's a gift of God. And it's a sign of a deep trust, deep within us, that Jesus, risen from the dead, present in word and sacrament, bringing peace and breathing Holy Spirit, will draw all people to himself so that through trusting, they, we, may have life in his name. <laughs>